Welcome to the first series of uh, sex and gender bias uh, in artificial intelligence and health. This is the first seminar of this uh, cycle uh, organized by the Bioinfo for Women program of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and La Caixa Foundation here at Palau Macaya in Barcelona. My name is uh, Davide Cirillo. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the Life Sciences Department of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And today I will be uh, the host and the moderator of this uh, session. After the opening conference last month, uh, we are back uh, today with an outstanding group of panelists and uh, our audience, both present and uh, virtual. The focus of today's seminar is the, the sex and gender perspective in the future of personalized medicine. We will talk about the necessity and the challenges to include sex and gender differences in biomedical research and clinical practice in order to achieve better prevention and diagnosis and improve treatment decisions. Decisions. We will also touch upon the role of, of artificial intelligence in this context and the biases that are associated with those systems. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce our panelists. So we have here Dr. Carmen Valls. Uh, she's a physician specialized in endocrinology with a gender perspective and uh, she is the director of the Women, Health and Quality of Life initiative at the Center for Health Analysis and Programs, CAPS. Uh, online, we have uh, Dr. Valeria Raparelli. She's Assistant Professor of Internal Medicine at the University of Ferrara in Italy and Adjunct Assistant Professor in the Faculty of Nursing at the University of Alberta, Canada. She's co-leader of the project Going Forward for Gender in Health at McGill University in Montreal and Principal Investigator of the Endocrine Vascular Disease Approach Project. Um, then online, we have Dr. Luis Rocha, Professor of Informatics at Indiana University in Bloomington, uh, where he's Director of the Interdisciplinary Training Program in Complex Networks and Systems and Director of the Center for Social and Biomedical Complexity. He's also Principal Investigator at the Institute Gulbenkian in Portugal. And uh, online as well, Dr. Silvina Catuara Solarts. Uh, she's a project evaluator and mentor of startups at uh, EIT Health, member of the WHO Digital Health Rooster of Experts, lead in technology application for neuroscience and mental health and member of the Women's Brain Project. I would like to thank you all for being here today. Uh, I'm really looking forward to our panel discussion which will take place uh, after the presentations from uh, each one of you. And uh, after the panel discussion, so at the end, uh, we will read the questions from the audience and uh, I invite uh, the audience actually to write the question in the chat that you can find in the streaming uh, service. So um, uh, let's start with the presentation. Let's follow the same order. So Carmen, <laughs> please, the stage is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> well, in primer lugar, uh, vamos a hablar de la perspectiva. Firstly, we're going to talk about the sex and gender perspective uh, in the future of medicine. And the first uh, problem that we found 30 years ago and which is ongoing is the fact that the majority of the uh, scientific papers do not include include the factors of sex and gender. And when we were talking about health, we saw that health goes beyond biology, but at the same time, it is biology, genetics, endocrinology, but immersed in a culture with different working conditions for men and women, with some mildering factors that do not uh, render the overload any milder, especially in the case of women, and with an environment that is conditioning the mental and physical health of the human beings. The gender differentiated research is very scarce and it is a mistake to mistake sex and gender. Sex is the biological and physiological characteristics, but the disaggregated statistics by sex are not updated in many of the papers and the lack of differentiation assumes that by studying men you're also studying women. The research with a gender perspective tries to analyze the health data in relation to the social, psychological, economical, political, ethical, cultural, environmental and biological uh, factors. It's not just the study of women, it's the study of the norms, uh, beliefs, rights, obligations and relationships that place women and uh, men on a different foothold. Sex as a variable in 
medical research has uh, been postulated in the recent 10 years and there are some papers that consider characteristics that have to do with gender from Clara Tannenbaum in Canada for example and there are studies and experiments that also consider that the sex of the researcher can have an impact on the result of the research. The gender biases in medicine I'm trying to synthesize them in a book of, uh, called um, Invisible Women for Medicine and we have the stereotypes of gender, the lack of women in the researched cohort, the lack of uh, female rats and uh, the lack of differential physiopathio physiopathology and the lack of uh, valuation of different working life and psychosocial overload. And I'm going to have a um, brief miscellaneous um, of uh, cases of gender bias. We have the preclinic pharmacological research, differential mortality and morbidity, differential pharmacokinetics, and um, environmental differentiating factors. The first um, bias by gender in research to use only male mice in blue. You can see that 70% of uh, the papers the preclinic studies in cardiovascular, the first uh, cause of mortality for women, it's just uh, comprising male mice. Uh, and in red, you can see the female mice and the clinical trials with mixed uh, mice is represented in yellow. In gray, you can see the mice um, where the gender is unidentified, so we cannot analyze it. And there's more gender-based stereotypes uh, influencing the design. And there is a study by Rebecca Shansky, which is really interesting and reflects upon the fact that as it is believed that men are the patterns because they have really good mental health, this uh, stereotype is still influencing the way in which researchers conduct their research. The cohorts needs to be mixed or differentiated. Well, in neuroscience, it's really important to know this. And by analyzing 300 papers on neuroscience devoted to research, we could see that the reason why male mice were not included in the research papers was uh, that Oh, sorry, why female mice were not included was that they thought that the female mice had a lot of variability in the hormones, but it seems like male mice have more variability in hormones. Why? Because when male mice uh, are gathered together, generate uh, some hierarchical relationships, and as a result of that, the testosterone levels outstrips five times more the dominated mice level. So when they conduct an analysis, the result, the clinical result, also have a high rate of variability. So we need to reflect before we conduct studies and before including uh, um, mice from one gender or the other, or from both sex, depending on the quality of paper you want to produce. And another important bias is how you leave the medicine faculty with um, the idea of how to prevent illnesses. Uh, medicine has the purpose of uh, expanding the quality of life. Uh, so when I ask professionals which is the first cause of death for women, they almost always get it, get, it, get it wrong. In men, the main cause of death is cancer in the different manifestations, and then there's miscellaneous. The first uh, cause of death for women is the ischemic cardiopathy, or um, brain stroke, cardiovascular causes on a world scale. This is from the WHO. And even though this dates back to 2009, if you click onto the WHO website, there is no clear, uh, well, the slide is not as clear as that one, but it also states that it still continues to be the same cause. And they do not assess uh, that the pathology of cardiopathy is the first uh, cause uh, for women because there, there is a false uh, belief that women are naturally protected uh, from um, heart infarction by their 
natural characteristics. And all the research papers from the 80s until the 90s failed to include any women in the research studies. 22,000 male for uh, coronary illnesses, etc. And this is a problem that we're going to find for the artificial intelligence papers that the risk factors uh, are analyzed uh, in a male scale and we do not know whether there are, there are different uh, risk factors for women. For years I have tried to gather all the causes of cardiovascular risk factors. And um, let me point out that there are some which are um, more female preponderant, uh, like uh, hormone therapies, which are uh, applied to women. And in hypothyroidism, it is really interesting to follow the population studies in the Rotterdam study. And it was proved that for myocardial infarction, hypothyroidism is uh, m more of a risk factor than smoking or diabetes, for example. And it was um, proved that by treating hypothyroidism, the endothelial cells uh, improve, which is the cause for cardiovascular problems. And little by little, and this is a study of uh, Anne M. Gillis, she's working on the differences in the electrocardiogram between female, uh, between women and men. And this is not known. You do not leave the medicine faculty knowing this. And this is not taken into consideration in the ER. And it's really important in the treatment because the QT space of the electrocardiogram is longer in female. And it, uh, there are, there is a higher power post infarction death rate in women. And taking into consideration the sex in uh, breathing illnesses, we can see that the hepatical uh, treatment of hydrocarbon elements uh, is higher in women. Smoking women have uh, higher levels of adduction. So in equal exposure situations, it's possible that the um, lung cancer is going to be the one that is going to increase the most. And it's also interesting to follow the Rotterdam study. We have seen some predisposing factors for Alzheimer regarding anemia and hemoglobin. And um, the iron alterations are more preponderant in women, and this was never related. If you had ferropenia, this is uh, something that predisposes you. So, we, in mortality, we have a lot of uh, lack of data, and in morbidity, even more, because we have uh, differences, biological, social, psychological differences that deserve special attention to women. And there are morbidi morbidities due to different biologies, due to the menstrual cycle, amenorrhea, oligomenorrhea, and uh, metrorrhagia, deficit of the luteinic phase, uh, premenstrual syndrome, etc. And then invisible morbidity because of anemia, ferropenia, osteopenia, and uh, genetically there is a trend there in women and this conditions more problems in thyroid problems because the main uh, cause is the autoimmune thyroid syndrome. And this is something that we're still witnessing right now because out of um, 2,484 studies uh, registered in the clinical trials until May last year, barely 4% of the papers uh, alluded to the differentiation of uh, sex and gender. And out of the 11 clinical trials, uh, uh, there was no segregation for gender 30 years ago. There was none, and we it continues to be the case. And in more in morbidity above uh, 50 years, we have hypertension, diabetes, uh, thyroid pathology, breast cancer, obesity, and uh, cardiovascular pathologies. And then another nuance is uh, the delay of uh, sex-based diagnosis. There is a delay 
of 700 illnesses uh, of uh, women versus male. And um, the diagnosis of cancer in women takes 2.5 years longer and for diabetes 4.5 years later as opposed to men. And the sex differences in genome and epigenome um, is being studied currently. Uh, the, uh, this author is really good in order to follow her to follow the gender-based differences. And then we fail to diagnose well. We do not have clear risk factors. And then we provide with medication, but the bodies of women metabolize drugs in a different manner. And they have a higher risk, risk of overdose and more secondary effects. The liver of women and men process hormones at, at a different rate. And out of 86 drugs research, 76% higher concentration in the body of women. This is not just explained because of the difference in size. And this is a paper from last year. Body composition. Women have a slower metabolism in drugs, a higher accumulation of lipophilic uh, drugs, bioaccumulation of insecticides and solvents, different concentrations of hydrophilic drugs depending on the water and the menstrual cycle because there is water retention during the cycle and changes in metabolism. And in men, um, the metabolism rate is higher, lower accumulation of lipophilic and solvents, etc. And in the hepatical metabolism, that's where we find the largest uh, differences. Um, the processing of hormones is different. Um, any hormone is going to become an estrogen in women, and estrogen and progesterone are metabolized uh, through ZIP3A4. And in men, the expressions of enzymes are different with uh, zip to do d6 and zip to e1 and this is not taken into consideration in research nor treatment and uh, pharmacokinetics has not been studied and sometimes it has been studied but it's not well known by the professionals i don't want to discourage the audience but it's like that and um, specific treatments for the uh, gender for the female gender are done without the backing of the studies. Uh, for example, the non-study differential pharmacokinetics, uh, the acetyl salicylic acid, aspirin, has not been tested and it can generate a hemorrhage in the intestines. And uh, the antiarrhythmic um, drugs generate more mortality in women because there is a different potassium pump in the cardiac cells in women and antilipidemic drugs and uh, they're prone to producing estatins and more so if they have even subclinical hypothyroidism and regarding specific <coughs> therapies um, the hormone treatments uh, were used in uh, by trial and error in women because they had just been studied in 100 women when they were put in the market uh, the contraceptives and also the replacement of hormonal therapy in the menopause was untested and there was an increase in cardiovascular risk and breast cancer and the uh, human papillomavirus uh, vaccine was applied to 10 year olds when it was studied with women above 24. So we need to change the way in which we research the age, the gender. It's really important in the analysis in the uh, animals, in the drug trials and how they are sold. And there's uh, only differential toxical effects. Um, the female body is a first uh, chemical bioaccumulator of pesticide solvents uh, and uh, plastic derivatives and the effect of alcohol is double and uh, smoking generates osteoporosis, anorexia or bulimic disorders uh, is more introduced in female bodies. And let me explain that this is from my environment and health um, book new risks for women and men and we have this avalanche of environmental 
endocrine disruptors uh, derived from plastic, flame retardant, retardants, hydrocarbon from the cars, etc., which have a different impact on women and men. And in women, these, all of these products are going to increase the level of estrogen in blood and it's going to generate alterations in the menstrual cycle, but also my more uh, alterations in the breast pre-menopause and uh, also menstruation alterations. So early menarchia, uh, early menopause, metrorage and alterations of the menstrual cycle and uh, sterility in men and women and atrophy of the testicles and uh, endometriosis, clinical fatigue, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia and breast cancer, diabetes, also related to the environment and obesity. It's not just eating a lot, but eating a lot with insecticides. This is going to generate the cycle. And in kids, this is also altering the fetus. Also at the moment of embryogenesis, the exposure of the parents to insecticide has increased the abortions and the fact that um, children, the female, that the um, girls can develop um, alterations in ovaries, in the ovaries, and also uh, the uh, boys can also have problems in the testicles as well as some other alterations. And sometimes instead of treating and diagnosing well, you introduce a treatment and the most heavily drugged one is the women's body. And this medication is added to the mental health because in Spain there is the highest consumption of drugs and the highest consumption is coming from women. They are more prone to consuming more antidepressants in women. And this is a study that has been conducted in all the autonomous regions and the uh, national average reaches 20% that is uh, consuming anxiolytic and uh, these kinds of drugs. And something we didn't know is that these psychopharmacological treatments act differently uh, in women and men. And women should have, have the dosage in order to achieve the results because of a different liver processing mechanism. So uh, we are lacking this differentiation. This is being built. Londa Chebingen, who is going to come on the last day. I, I have been following her for a, a long time in order to be able to understand many differences. This is a science that we need to build and for more than 20 years we wrote a book on how to adapt the curricula to the health problems and we should start by working cardiopathy and endocrinology and not just gynecology. Women are not just walking uterus, it's more than that and it requires a specific study. And Nielsen and Schibinger in 2018 also suggested that the innovation of gender and sex should work in the diversity of the research teams. The more diversity, the better. Diversity in the methods of research and diversity in the problems to be researched because otherwise if we follow the pharmaceutical industry, we would be stuck to researching uh, cholesterol. I leave you here my magazine. As a society did not pay heed to us, we generated this uh, magazine with uh, these different issues. And thank you very much. Uh, for this really deep dive into the importance and implications of sex differences from uh, clinical studies to drug design even to the environmental effect I mean it's really it's really interesting um, okay so uh, Valeria uh, you are the next one
Can you see my screen? Yes, thank you so much. Okay, so thank you so much to the BioInfo for Women program at the BSC and to the Kaisha Foundation for the kind invitation. It's really a pleasure for me to be here and discuss uh, uh, with all of you how sex and gender really are uh, getaways uh, uh, for the future of precision medicine. Just a bit of background about me. I was trained in Rome and I got my first position as assistant professor over there. Then I did my PhD in Berlin at the Institute of Gender Medicine under the supervision of Professor Rigitz Zagrosek. Then I moved in 2017 in Montreal, Canada, where really I wanted to um, go because I want to acquire skills in terms of gender-based analysis. And now, since uh, uh, 2021, I'm here in this uh, jewelry of the north of Italy, which is called Ferrara. And I have to, to say that the diversity of the working environment, uh, I was really increased my capability of applied sex and gender-based analysis in my clinical studies. So uh, this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, first of all, to me, precision medicine is really a sex and gender informed uh, medicine type. And uh, I want to say that uh, and share with you what I have learned so far in terms of integration of sex and gender in my clinical study. And please watch out throughout my presentation all the warning signs that to me are the most relevant take on message of this presentation. And I will provide you really some practical example of how I have uh, I dealt with uh, uh, sex and gender in non-communicable chronic disease, specifically cardiovascular disease. And uh, in the last year, uh, how I tried to apply this uh, um, lens also to, for the understanding of the COVID pandemic using uh, the going forward approach that I will explain you later. So uh, I'm a clinical scientist, but I'm also a practicing clinician. And really, uh, I have witnessed it to the 21st century paradigm shift of medicine. So uh, my present uh, is to base my um, clinical decision on the findings of randomized controlled trial. But I'm starting to appreciate um, the powerful tools and the algorithm that uh, are the basis of the uh, precision medicine approach. Actually, precision medicine to me is an extension of my existing medical care. Um, it's a model for healthcare delivery that relies on uh, big data and uh, new uh, technology and uh, analytic tools. So we are in the middle of the so-called multi-omics revolution. So today we are really uh, have the opportunity to capture the whole picture of biological system in uh, uh, hypothesis-free and unbiased models. And to me, the most important, uh, uh, the ultimate goal, it's always to improve uh, uh, passion outcome. So if we compare uh, precision medicine approach to the traditional ones, we really uh, want to now value uh, the individual variability in terms of genes, environment, lifestyle for each person, because we want to better uh, stratify the risk of individuals and then provide them tailored intervention to get uh, a common benefit across all the subgroups. So really uh, the goal of precision medicine is equity in, uh, in health because we wanna really uh, provide each individual what fits uh, his needs to achieve uh, health. But also, I think that precision medicine cannot be only genetics uh, and omics, because if we really want to uh, characterize and individualize treatment and diagnostic tool, we really need to ask your, ourselves who are our patients. And there are two features, as uh, already Dr. Valls uh, mentioned, that really um, better define who we are, which are sex, 
uh, when we use the term sex, we refer to all the biological attributes of people, including physical feature, chromosome, gene expression, hormones, anatomy. But uh, uh, maybe more uh, um, overlooked, we are also uh, gender, gendered people, meaning that there are some social constructed role, behavior, expression, and identities that we should take in, into account when it comes to health. And so the most important message here is that sex and gender are not interchangeable terms, and we should be really careful in uh, the use uh, of uh, these terms. And why uh, we need to consider these two different sides of the coin when it comes uh, to health and disease. Because as you can see in this picture, both sex and gender are equally relevant in shaping the health and disease of people. And in the majority of Cain, case, even though sex is not always included uh, as biological variables in our study, the situation is even worse when it comes to uh, gender. And when uh, we are not including gender, we are really missing a big piece uh, of the picture. But why is this the case? Uh, why we, as a clinical scientist or practicing clinician, we, we are not used to consider gender in our, uh, in our practice? Uh, because really the first order is uh, to understand the complexity and the multidimensionality that gender encompasses. Because as you can see, there are different domains that we should take into consideration to describe the gender of an individual, like the role the identity, the, the relation in the society, and also the institutionalized gender, uh, which is the distribution of uh, um, forces uh, and power uh, inside the society between males and females. And even worse, uh, we are uh, a bit... Uh, um, we have difficulties in really measuring gender because there is not a standardized method for doing so. Uh, and also, uh, doing a step back, we need to consider that we commonly do not include such kind of variable in our uh, clinical study. So uh, I think that we should do more uh, for the inclusion of gender and sex in, uh, in our um, life science research. And as a clinical scientist, usually to answer my research question, uh, I, I find myself in front of two possible scenarios. On one side, I, I can have already collect data sets available, and I can use this information, this data source for answering my question, sex and gender-based question. Or I might be in the position of designing a new, a new study for uh, assessing prospectively the effect of gender on my outcome. Actually, Nowadays, there is not uh, um, a common pathway or roadmap to follow uh, to integrate gender in, uh, in this kind of, uh, of research. And today I'm sharing with you the, my answer, which is the answer of the Going Forward Network. Um, the Going Forward Network uh, is really a multidisciplinary uh, team of people that have an expertise as scientists in uh, sex and gender-based analysis, uh, lots of investigators from different countries in Europe and also um, in Canada. And as you can see here, really a key element uh, for uh, uh, facing in the proper way all the challenges that sex and gender-based analysis pose is to have a, a, a multidisciplinary approach, so not only uh, life scientists experts, but also computer scientists, social scientists, to um, achieve uh, better science and to um, deal better with these uh, issues. The main uh, um, 
aim uh, of our consortium is to really uh, to identify innovative way for integrate sex and gender domains uh, in applied health research and we want to assess the impact of such variable on clinical cost sensitive outcome and patient related outcome in a, a wide range of no communicable chronic disease we have access to um, several data sets and we, we really want to advance uh, the knowledge in, uh, in this field. Uh, the first deliverable of our uh, network project was to develop a standard methodology that uh, all the researchers can uh, use um, to, uh, and apply to persisting court uh, studies for the integration agenda in assessing their impact uh, on health outcome. As you can see, there are five steps. For a matter of time, I cannot go through them, but for sure we can discuss uh, later in the panel discussion. But just I want to tell you that to to assist uh, clinical uh, scientists in this effort of implementation of gender in their research question, we provided a, a wish list of gender related variable that you might find in your data sets and that could be um, of relevance uh, to include uh, in your uh, analysis plan. And then uh, if you are instead in the position of starting a new study, uh, also we provide as going forward uh, a roadmap that uh, uh, clinicians can use to define all the steps for including properly in their design uh, the sex and gender domains. Okay, once you have collected uh, either retrospectively or prospectively this information about the gender, how do you include them in your analysis plan? Once again, there is not a unique solution to, to, to this uh, answer, uh, to this question, but uh, it depends uh, really on the richness of your databases and uh, um, of, uh, on, on the research question you have. You can either compute a composite measure of gender if you have uh, lots of variable, gender-based variable, or instead you can just assess the effect of individual factor, gender-related factor on your outcome. Let's see some example. This is a landmark uh, paper that really provided a guidance on how to construct uh, a composite measure of uh, gender, a gender score. Uh, this is uh, um, the results of the Genesis Praxi, which is a multi-center perspective, a larger observational study um, that enrolled uh, young patient with premature uh, acute coronary syndrome. As you can see, the Canadian investigator led by Dr. Pilot were able to identify seven uh, main items uh, in their population that can be used uh, for for generating uh, a propensity score for gender that goes from zero to 100. And as you can see, females and uh, males have really a wide distribution of gender. And there is also uh, um, an area of overlapping. Why you should consider gender on top or beyond uh, sex in your evaluation because it's going to change um, the relevance of your finding and it will allow you to better stratify the outcome because if you look at just the sex disaggregated data in terms of outcome after one year of follow-up in this specific vulnerable course so you will see that there are no difference in terms of incidence of adverse event while if you stratify your population based on the gender score, you will see that uh, and you will identify those uh, males and female with uh, um, feminine characteristic, meaning characteristics that society traditionally ascribed to women. These patients are uh, those uh, that are more likely to um, experience adverse event in the follow-up. So really, gender uh, can make a difference and predicts better uh, 
clinical uh, outcome when you uh, apply this uh, uh, specific lens. And then as a going forward project, uh, we also uh, have a look about the effect of sex, gender on cardiovascular health, and we make um, multi-country comparison because we have accessibility to the Canadian Community Health Survey and to the Austrian Health Interview Survey, uh, both uh, um, collected in 2019. We used as exposure sex and uh, a gender score that we were able to um, compute uh, with the gender-related variable in these data sets, and then how our was to really uh, measure a cardiovascular health, the CAN Heart Index and the Heat Heart Index. As you can see, you, it's composed by six cardiometabolic risk factor. It ranges from zero to six, and the higher it is, the better uh, is the cardiovascular health. As I showed you before, following the Genesis Proxy methodology, we were able to construct a country-specific gender score for this population. And once again, you can see a wide distribution, a spectrum of gender across the sexes that's different among the two countries. And then here we will look at the distribution of the gender score based on uh, the state of cardiovascular health. And once again, you can see that those patients that uh, um, have more feminine characteristics with a higher gender score are those with the worse outcomes. Worse, worse cardiovascular health. And when we, we, we try to assess the independent effect of sex, gender, or the cardiovascular risk factor on the development of uh, um, overt heart disease, what we found was that uh, in this young population, even though uh, sex and having um, a better cardiometabolic risk profile was associated, was protective in terms of development of heart disease, you can see how the gender score really uh, exert a detrimental effect and was so strongly associated with uh, um, cardiovascular diseases. And also, in the comparison between the two groups, you can see that the magnitude uh, of the fact was different and more uh, pronounced in uh, uh, Austrian population. What about including instead just one domain? Here, uh, I'm providing you an example um, that the going forward uh, uh, investigator um, published recently regarding the COVID-19 pandemic and influence of sex and gender domains on uh, cases and uh, case fatality rate. Uh, we uh, gather uh, information about cases and um, case fatality uh, using the data tracker of the Global Health 5050 initiative that provided sex disaggregated data. Um, as you can see at the time of our analysis, only 33 countries provided this information and this is really disappointing uh, considering how relevant and clear are the difference between female and male in, in terms of development and prognosis of this uh, um, infection disease. Uh, as usual, we started with a conceptual framework on how gender may be related to differences prevalence on COVID-19 between males and female, and how gender could affect exposure and testing for uh, the infection. And how uh, we included gender in, in this uh, research equation? Uh, we used the Gender Inequality Index, uh, which is uh, uh, provided by the um, United Nations for each country and is a measure of uh, um, gender inequality in that country. It depends uh, on the distribution of health empowerment and labor market between males and females. And those countries that have the higher gender inequality are really those that 
favor ma males over females. And as you can see here, the highest in the gender inequality index uh, is uh, the higher is the male to female ratio of positive cases. Why uh, is this the case? Uh, it could be because there are differences in biological differences in risk factor between males and females, or it might be related to the different uh, um, seeking care behavior that has been already um, uh, showed in other conditions such as cardiovascular diseases. And finally, uh, as already Dr. Vala um, mentioned, um, gender champions in the field are such as uh, um, Professor uh, Kara Tannenbaum on Londa Schimger. Uh, they really um, call for action and call for a structural change to uh, implement sex and gender um, domains in, uh, in clinical science and in research also uh, in, in other uh, fields. Uh, we really need to value as funding agency, university and uh, dissemination tools, so peer review journals, Journal, uh, the importance of providing sex disaggregated data to provide gender disaggregated data and to analyze the effect of this variable on outcome if we want to uh, achieve better results and more uh, um, better science. And then uh, a topic of discussion that I'm sure we will be able to um, to go deep uh, later is that I think that we if uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence, if we do not feed properly our algorithms so with sex uh, and gender-based uh, uh, variable, we will never be able to achieve uh, fair and equitable uh, algorithms for predicting outcome. And uh, I thank you all of you for the attention and uh, all the investigators that are working uh, with me for advancing uh, the integration of sex and gender uh, in clinical uh, study. Thank you so much. Thank you, Valeria, for this uh, overview uh, on uh, the, the, the relevance of uh, sex and in particular gender factors in, uh, in health and all the challenges that are associated with, uh, with it. Thank you so much. Um, Luis, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, perfect. Thank right. you so much. Uh, you can see my slides, right? Yep. Oh, okay. All right. So I'm Luis Fascia. So I'm from Indiana University, where um, I direct uh, the Center for Social and Biomedical Complexity with my colleague, uh, Johan Bolin, that we see there in the image with uh, a lot of the people. Um, I'm also associated, as David said, with the Institute of Gubankian Ciencia in Portugal. So uh, I'm going to, to do something uh, a little different. So I'm going to start, for, I, I want to study bias and, uh, and artificial intelligence and, and biomedical complexity, but I'm going to start from a, a, a general uh, systems thinking way to frame the problem that I hope it's not too general uh, and I hope can facilitate some discussions as we go forward. Um, so when we do science in general, not just biomedical science, but also biomedical science, we, we, we go into the world and we decide to measure some observables um, in the world. We carve out a portion of the world that is of interest to us. And then what we do is to convert whatever we observe in the world and society, in nature and society, into some form of symbols and some form of images that we then assemble into some kind of formal model. Uh, this is what we call a scientific model. Um, and therefore, so what we do in order to, to deal with predictions about the world is to study the logical consequences of this model rather than the world itself, right? So this is, it's pretty obvious for how we do science. So the world is doing its own thing. We don't know how it's doing its own thing. Let me call it for uh, shorthand natural laws, but we don't know actually how the, how the world does it its thing. Um, and so the idea is that we have this correspondence between what really happens in the world versus the symbols, this data that we uh, accumulate. Uh, and then we hope that our models match our observations in somehow. Um, so the, perhaps the first person who actually studied this or, or put this in this precise form was Hertz. 
um, in which he really observed this correspondence between what really happens in the world versus our scientific models, our, our, our images, as he, as he put it. Uh, and, you know, obviously we do this because we want to anticipate the future. And that's the biggest, biggest reason why we do this kit model. Not only we want to understand, but you want to be able to pre prevent and, uh, um, and, and, uh, and predict what's going to happen in the world in the future. So many people have talked about this, particularly in the 20th century. I, I will just highlight, say, a famous physicist, Eugene Wigner, who is actually, he has a beautiful paper that I put there on the side uh, in which he actually marvels why does this even work? Uh, why would we expect mathematical models, formal models, to even be able to, to sort of predict the, uh, the world in any way? And there, there are issues with that. Uh, in particular, he immediately pick, picked one that was uh, every empirical law has the disquieting quality that one does not know its limitations. So I'm going to talk this because I think bias is a limitation of how we model the world, and so let, let me uh, dig a little bit, a little bit more into how this uh, this works. So, uh, I think, especially if we're given the talks that we just heard, uh, we all under, uh, agree here that the world is a complex. Uh, a, a set of phenomena, it's contextual, it's multi-layered, especially in biomedicine. It goes all the way from the molecular um, to, the, to the organ, to the, to the human, to the social, to the technological, to even the political. Uh, uh, and so uh, we all agree that the world is complex. So how do we study it? So the first piece of good news that allow us to tackle this complexity was perhaps articulated by Herb Simon, in 1962, where he observed, even though we have all this complexity, for the largest part, we can approach the world uh, um, with fairly simple methods because the world is kind of hierarchical. In other words, there are a subset of observables or variables that are actually quite nicely encapsulated, and then we can carve out and choose to not include other variables because most of the time they don't affect the interest, the system that we are interested in studying. Those other variables could perhaps work at a different time scale, or, or perhaps uh, they just very rarely influence your system of study. So this is, by and large, how we still go about studying complex systems. It's very in vogue to find modularity structure on, on systems so that we can understand those things that uh, are more interrelated with one another than to with other variables. And, and therefore, we use this to carve out categories and classes that allow us to study uh, things separately from others. And by and large, this is work. This is one of the biggest things that people do in science. I'm just pointing out one of my favorite papers from Marta Salas Pardo there in Tarragona, uh, in which you looked at protein networks, for instance, and find the modularity in the hierarchical structure uh, of, 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 of protein interaction networks. So that's, by and large, we can do that. Another piece of good news that scientists use for the longest time um, is based on empiricism. It goes even before this. Uh, they become the idea that the future really is predicted by the past, and that the, 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 what we observe about the past tells us something about the future, and we can induce, you can use induction to predict the future or predict or, or understand the world. So uh, putting this back in the, in the Hertz way, so what we do by induction is that we use a lot of examples for a particular system and from there generate a rule, uh, which is typically cast as some kind of, of, of model with statistical regularities. This is, for all of those of you who do AI and machine learning, this is how machine learning works. So machine learning is a process of automating this sort of induction process that we talk about, where we feed a lot of examples, a lot of data to models that find these statistical regularities and then allow us to do prediction. So everything you're used to in machine learning, classification and regression falls into this. And so this works really well uh, when the world is uh, functions like this, right? So for instance, things like the sun, we can always predict that it raises in the east and it will set in the west. So therefore, what you previously observed is very good about predicting uh, what you observe in the future. So uh, the, these two, putting these two pieces of good news together, we have, we, we, it gives us the ability uh, to model 
complex systems, uh, even though they're multi-layered, even though they're contextual, uh, we can still tackle them because we assume, as Herb Simon, that they are what he called near decomposable, that we can carve out these modules in hierarchies, and also that the past follows from, from uh, the, the future follows from the past. Um, so, you know, of course, uh, especially in the second half of the 20th century, people have been pointing that, you know, there are complex systems that go far beyond this. These are probably what we would call simple uh, systems. And so let me show you uh, how this comes about. Of course, uh, um, we know that uh, AI and all sorts of uh, other induction techniques uh, always have to be based on a kind of a leap, an inductive leap. We are always sort of assuming that the past will predict the future, uh, but this might not work so well, uh, or the data that we have, because um, as famously Karl Popper has observed, your induction is dictated by your pre previous observations, is actually biased by your previous observations. So whatever data you have collected up to the past will bias what you are predicting about the future. Uh, you know, and this is usually uh, put, uh, as, as Karl Popper did, with this metaphor of, of the swans, in which for the longest time, Europeans always thought that so all swans are white because only white swans existed in Europe. Uh, it took uh, Europeans to arrive to Australia to realize that there was a black swan, right? Uh, so if you were just following an induction process, we, you will generalize by a rule that all, swan, all swans are white, when in truth, uh, uh, there are black swans. So, so Popper used this to say that we can never prove a theory, that we can only falsify it by observe, uh, an inductive theory. Uh, we can only falsify it. But here you can see immediately how this is related to some of the, of the conversations we had so far. In many ways in biomedical research, the data was, was biased towards men and women were somewhat like of a black swan uh, uh, in biomedical research that we don't, uh, uh, that we didn't expect the changes that we that we have observed. Um, another piece of bad news for the approach that I was mentioning uh, has to do that, you know, going back to this multi-layer uh, systems is that uh, we can observe, especially in biological organization, they are not that neatly boxed out. It's very easy to find in, bi in, in biomedicine in instances where lower levels affect greatly or control higher levels. Uh, if anything, the pandemic that we are observing is a great example in which we have a zoonotic event that passed from virus to human. And from this, it affected tremendously all the levels above, not just our health, but our societies, our even our politics, uh, our social, our, our economy, right? So you can see that it's not that easy to carve out uh, 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 in a hierarchical structure all these levels to study. This was uh, first put in you know, observed by Howard Patti, which was one of my, my advisors in his book, uh, Hierarchy Theory, The Challenge of Complex Systems, in which his key insight is that complex systems are not reducible to these Simon-like uh, 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 hierarchies uh, that are self-contained, these boxed mechanisms, nor are they easily predict from past data because these events can be quite rare. These events that from a lower level that control the next level are actually usually very rare and you don't observe them by in induction very easily in your data. Um, and this was also at the same time by another theoretical biologist, Robert Rosen, also th that was working with Howard Patti in his book, Anticipatory Systems, actually observed that any inductive model, uh, mechanistic inductive model of a truly complex system will eventually deviate from your observation. This is what he called a model failure. Uh, so when you look at these inductive data sooner or later, they're gonna fail with some observation. So their, their insight from this is that in addition to inductive models, complex systems always need a kind of multi-level actionable uh, models and theory. We need to have a higher level theoretical underpinning where we can predict things or we can consider things that we don't even observe. 
uh, we have to not just be circumscribed to an inductive sort of um, uh, analysis of data. Um, more recently, this become very in fashion again by, uh, by the work of Nassim Taleb, especially coming back with the idea of black swans. In my view, he re he's recapitulating what Robert Rosen and Howard Petty did in the 1970s in theoretical biology, but uh, Taleb comes from more of a, of a financial expertise and, and, and indeed what he says is basically true. So just put positioning um, um, what these guys said in back into the Hertzian way of seeing things is a little more complex than the way Hertz was seeing. The world is, and there's the specter of Popper there too, the world is more complex than we usually think. And in particular, there are often unknown unknowns, unknown variables that we are not observing when we build our black box model that can make us, that, that give rise to these black swan events that then make our observations fail. This is very easily seen in many famous approaches to artificial intelligence. For instance, and I'm not going to go into a lot of the detail of this, but you can. You, there's this famous case of Google flu that predicted very well flu outbreaks for a, 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 a certain amount of time and then fail miserably. Uh, and if you want to know how, how this is sort of like a black swan event because of, of an intrinsic failure, a system failure um, uh, because of that did not track the changes in the only uh, in the search mechanisms of Google, please read this paper by Alessandro Vespignani and David Lazar, where this is sort of outlined uh, how, why it failed. So now, coming back to medicine and not just this, or, or use of AI in diverse uh, societies and see how this leads uh, into biases, uh, we all know that the, because of the data that we use for our induction mechanisms, and AI is nothing more than an automated induction uh, technique, uh, we, we, we are all familiar with the way these systems fail. For instance, these facial recognition systems from Microsoft and IBM are much better at predicting why white male faces than they are at darker female faces because in the tech domain they have a lot more white men to try to, to, to test the, the data than they did uh, dark females, right? So they did much worse at predicting the features of females because of that data. More, even more uh, dangerously, there's this famous case of a, a system to predict risk that was assisting police uh, in some training situations where people with these sort of uh, very similar or exact same prior offenses were actually given much higher risk when they were uh, just because of their race. So if they were black, they were given a much higher risk for having very similar past offenses or even worse than white people because they were trained uh, on, on, on police data, which is itself biased. Um, so in our, in our own work, um, we have looked at these sorts of biases in data, uh, you, uh, analyzing very large records of uh, electronic health records. This is a, a collaboration with a postdoc in my group, uh, Rion Kouraya, and where we looked at um, uh, the entire population of a city in Brazil, in Blumenau, and we built the, the drug interactions that exist. The, they are known, but are still prescribed to patients, even though we know they are drug, drug interactions. And we separated them by gender and found out that women are much are prescribed a lot more interaction. So one thing that it's important to see here in this first plot, you see that when we look at simultaneous prescription of medication, there's no really hardly no difference between men and women. So the risk of being given more than one drug at a time in as you age is the same for men and women. But when you look at the risk of known interactions, uh, females get, have a much higher risk, especially in this data set, uh, after 45, 50 years old of being prescribed uh, known interactions. Now, of course, one of the questions that we deal here in this workshop is, is this a social or a biomedical bias that exists here? And how do we separate both of them? Um, and towards that, in our, in, towards having this kind of theoretical underpinning that I was talking earlier that allow us to reason about the inductions we do from these data, we started recently a collaboration with Alfonso Valencia and John Sanchez Valles and other, others, and I apologize for not having their uh, photos here, but these are the people I interact most with. Um, 
uh, we started comparing the data from Brazil to data in all the electronic records of Catalonia and also data we obtained from Indianapolis, which is a private system. The other two are public systems to see if this uh, thing that we had observed in, in, in Blumenau of females having a much higher risk than males is observed in the other ones. And we see that in Catalonia is not as, is as prevalent, but it's still a bias for females, but it does have a bias uh, in earlier ages that you don't even see in Blumenau, for instance, it's not clear uh, uh, completely why females have such a higher risk uh, of, of the, than males uh, at, from 15 to 25. In the United States, there's an interesting switch that males become, after a certain age, uh, become uh, uh, more problematic. So I'm not going to go into the details of this, and we can discuss this more. The point of this comparative analysis is to try to allow us to um, differentiate what is that uh, what is social from what is biological and what is actually uh, a future of the economics uh, uh, of each one of these different systems that we can go in detail. But we also want to move towards modeling to have actionable interventions. What can we do to prevent this? So for instance, Jan uh, very recently started looking at this. And if you, if you remove a single drug from the data set in Catalonia, omeprazole, and substitute it by other proton inhibitors uh, that exist in the market, you reduce the risk to females a lot. Um, and it's it, the males also reduces, but you actually get a little a little closer just by removing that drug um, and, and putting uh, another one of a, of a similar class. So putting back this and almost to finalize, putting all this back into shape, what I'm advocating here is not that we stop using induction and data science and AI and all of that, is that we use that for our, uh, we use induction only for parameter estimation uh, of models and theoretical models at a higher level. So for instance, the example we just saw of considering gender as, as a variable is a theoretical underpinning of data that we might observe. And this allows us then to test unobserved scenarios that even are very rare of observation and see what they would mean for our data set. So we, uh, we still have induction, but we do induction more as a means to inform our actionable models. And to finalize, I'll give you an example of the type of model from systems biology that we like to work. This is a, um, a breast cancer model, a estrogen receptor uh, plus a, a, a model that was built by Reka Albert. And that we have, uh, and so just to, to very quickly say these models are built by huge amounts of induction from all the literature, all the multi-elmic databases. Every edge here was is data from many labs and many experiments. But once we make these network models, we are then able to query them theoretically. Uh, and we provided a, a technique to actually look at the interactions of medications <laughs> into how to either kill the cancer cells to lead them to apoptosis or, or stop them from proliferating. And for instance, identified that three drugs do nothing to, to this type of cancer in this kind of work. But this allows us to play with scenarios that are not even observed. So I'm not going to go into a lot of the details of this work. And I'll finalize. This is a very recent paper of ours. If you're interested in reading how we sort of use these models to have a causal um, uh, alternative strategies analysis of, uh, of, um, uh, of cancer in this case, and you know, read this paper. And so for now, uh, I, this is it, and thank you for listening to me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Luis. Thank you so much for guiding us through the, the, the foundation of the formal models that are at the basis of artificial intelligence systems and also the insight now that can get, we can get from uh, complex systems in order to overcome bias and uh, prevent it. Thank you so much. Uh, Silvina, you can uh, share the screen. Perfect. Can you hear me now? Yes, and we can see the slides. Thank you so much.
So yeah, so thank you so much uh, for having me in this uh, wonderful uh, seminar for this uh, very relevant topic. I'm also very honored to share the panel with these uh, outstanding uh, speakers uh, that have provided their different perspectives from the clinical domain, from the biomedical research, and also for a much more uh, mathematical and, and computational uh, perspective. So I'm Silvina. Uh, David introduced me earlier. Uh, so I come from the biomedical research world, uh, but after my time in academia, I spent uh, quite some time uh, in the private sector, in the pharmaceutical sector, and also I have been working in the technology sector, specifically for digital health interventions. I'm part of the World Health Organization uh, roast of uh, experts in digital health, and I'm also part of the Women's Brain Project. Um, so I am particularly interested in this uh, topic of sex and gender perspective and, and personalized medicine. I believe that uh, by now everyone uh, must be convinced that uh, personalized medicine is all about understanding the individual differences among patients and using these individual differences to better provide the diagnosis and to better provide a treatment. And the, the key of uh, personalized medicine is to provide an accurate uh, profiling of individuals based on their uh, specific characteristics, then to stratify the population uh, according to their different uh, uh, specific features, and then to deliver the right interventions that are tailored to the specific uh, clusters of individuals in order to provide the, the best possible uh, health outcomes and the best uh, possible effects of these uh, interventions. And basically, uh, this is a very uh, interesting and promising and ambitious uh, approach of, of personalized medicine that uh, requires also a very deep understanding, uh, as very nicely Luis was uh, referring to, uh, of a multi-level uh, understanding of health and disease, uh, starting from the genes, but also going forward to the physiology and also understanding the social and the behavioral dynamics of an individual because as the world health organization properly uh, stands, uh, health is not only the absence of disease, but is a complete and general uh, state of physical, mental, and social uh, well-being. And during uh, the last uh, period, the last uh, couple of uh, decades, actually there has been a great uh, progress on our understanding of human health and human uh, diversity at many of these uh, different uh, levels. But but actually, uh, the sex and gender differences that is our primarily focus today remains as a big gap and remains uh, to be explored in many uh, different areas. Uh, it is uh, something that uh, we know that has an uh, impactful uh, effect in health, uh, both uh, directly and indirectly. We know that uh, the biological sex has, uh, through the different uh, gene expression and, and hormone differences, it has an effect on the way that some diseases uh, perform some clinical manifestations and also the way that uh, individuals uh, respond to specific treatments. And we also know that at the more like a social, social cultural uh, gender uh, level, there are also some uh, effects, there are associated differences at the level of some more like uh, lifestyle behaviors, uh, for example, at the level of nutrition and exercise and smoking and stress that in turn have an effect at the epigenetic level. They uh, provoke some epigenetic modifications that are related with health. And on the other hand, we know that the sociocultural uh, gender also is associated with some uh, behaviors uh, related with health such as uh, help seeking and also the use of healthcare and also the therapeutic response in terms of, for example, some adherence to the prescription of the interventions. 
And all these uh, sex and gender differences actually are manifested in how difference uh, in the prevalence of uh, diseases and also the causes of death are distributed uh, across male and female individuals. Uh, one uh, very uh, relevant uh, difference that this uh, is, re is remarkable is the higher rate of suicide, for example, in male individuals. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it is also very relevant. I think it was previously mentioned by Carmen, the higher uh, prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and also stroke uh, in female individuals. Uh, these are just a few examples, but actually there are many, many more. Um, but one of the reasons why we are all here today is because uh, technology has been a very uh, has been going through a huge progress during the last uh, decades. Uh, that's uh, one of the reasons why Barcelona Supercomputing Center is uh, so engaged also with this uh, particular topic. And during these uh, last decades, there has been a huge progress on the development of a variety of technologies uh, that are helping helping us to understand these inter-individual uh, differences among uh, patients and, and, and different uh, people. And some of these uh, technologies are involved with the collection and the analysis of different type of data sets, uh, for example, omics uh, data sets that are related with the genome, the proteome, uh, some metabolomics, and, and this type of very uh, biomedical type of data sets. Then, uh, we have uh, data sets more related with the technology uh, biosensors that are informative of the health status of the person. Uh, also some technologies related with the, uh, with the storage and the analysis of electronic medical records about also cognitive function and the way that we interact with our digital devices, the way that we can automatize the analysis of clinical images, and also the way uh, that we can analyze social behavior of individuals. Of, uh, on top of all this, there are also some uh, technologies that are able to uh, provide remote uh, monitoring and delivery of digital therapeutic interventions that are really making a big impact uh, these uh, days, particularly with the pandemic. And very importantly, there are technologies that can give us predictions of the health outcomes of particular individuals giving their specific characteristics. So all these uh, technologies are really giving us a uh, very uh, wide uh, type of opportunities to implement the personalized uh, medicine approach throughout the lifespan of individuals, uh, you know, across uh, the, the whole life in different stages of uh, their uh, conditions. For example, in the early stages, these technologies can help uh, to provide uh, interventions that are focused on prevention and for enhancement of their wellness and well-being. Later on, uh, some technologies can help to provide an accurate and early diagnosis of conditions. And of course, they also can help clinicians to make decisions and to design the type of uh, healthcare interventions and to monitor the symptoms throughout the, the diseases that patients are experimenting for the management of these uh, patients that sometimes they are uh, suffering from chronic uh, conditions. So these are uh, very uh, powerful uh, technologies and these are for sure technologies that are going to revolutionize uh, the future of medicine uh, but the tricky thing about these uh, technologies and involving artificial intelligence as well is that they can act as a double-edged sword. And this is uh, something that we have uh, exposed in our uh, paper that we published uh, last year together with the Women's Brain Project and the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And what we mean by this is that uh, on one hand, these technologies, if uh, create 
created without uh, removing uh, biases and also confounding factors, they can worsen the health disparities. They can even perpetuate some of this uh, sex and gender uh, inequalities that currently exist. And on the other hand, uh, if we create these uh, technologies in a way that we uh, incorporate the sex and gender differences, they can promote the right way to establish the personalized medicine that we are all interested in. So here, I'm going to give you a few examples of how these uh, two sides of the coin or two edges of the sword uh, have been uh, substantiated. So here on the top, I'm bringing you this example that is uh, an algorithm that uses X-ray images in order to diagnose thoracic diseases. And what happened was that uh, it had a much worse performance for females in comparison to males. And the reason was that the data set that was used to train and to construct this algorithm was not using a representative uh, sample of the, the different conditions across uh, male and female. And then I'm, I'm bringing you here another example that is about a model for hip replacement surgery that did not take into account the differences in female bone structure leading to poorer outcomes in females, in, in women going through this uh, type of interventions. And in the third one here, I'm bringing you the pulse oximeter that is uh, this device to measure the oxygenated blood, which is having less accurate measurement in both uh, women and men of color, uh, leading to misdiagnosis and, and wrong measurements uh, for people having, for example, hypo hypooxemia. Uh, so in these three examples, I'm showing you how, in these cases, these technologies actually can uh, have can provide disadvantages for a specific uh, sociodemographic uh, or minority group. But on the other hand, uh, in some cases, actually, uh, when uh, designed properly, these uh, technologies can be really helpful. And I'm bringing you here, uh, the first example is about the use of artificial intelligence in order to diagnose uh, the risk of neurodevelopmental disorders, considering uh, genome and also clinical data sets that were disaggregated uh, by sex. And this is really uh, elucidating a lot of, uh, of the mechanisms that are possibly related with this heterogeneity in neurodevelopmental disorders, like autistic uh, spectrum disorders and so on. Uh, second one here is the Aware DX, that is an algorithm for the prediction of the drug response and also secondary effect, adverse effects of drugs, but differences of these uh, effects in, between men and women in the context of drug development and also drug repurposing and drug uh, pharmacogenetic uh, studies. So this uh, algorithm has uh, shown a lot of uh, accuracy and it's very useful uh, in order not to uh, include in the market some uh, drugs that we will that will then show uh, secondary effects, for example, in one uh, particular group that is what has been happening throughout the years uh, lately. Um, and then here, the third example is an algorithm for the diagnosis of COVID-19 based on only four parameters. And one of them was uh, particularly sex and was uh, very relevant uh, because of all the differences that have been shown uh, with sex in the type of symptoms and the, uh, the severity of the illness, uh, particularly uh, for death. So as you can see, there are these uh, two sides, let's say, of technology. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, uh, last year, uh, in order to reflect our thoughts and our perspective on this uh, topic, we published, uh, uh, together with Women's Brain Project and the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, as well as many other uh, institutions, this uh, paper 
in which uh, we uh, propose this uh, framework uh, that uh, illustrates how the use of artificial uh, artificial intelligence in biomedicine needs to incorporate these uh, good practices so that they can reduce all these undesirable biases that are really going to sustain all the health inequalities that exist currently on sex and gender. And on the other side, to enhance the desirable differences and to really be used in order to understand uh, what are uh, the biological and sociocultural uh, factors that are related with this uh, sex and gender differences in health and disease in order to really be able to apply this uh, personalized medicine approach. And many of these uh, good practices and, and part of actually this uh, solution basically are relying on two things uh, that are uh, one, uh, having representative data sets, representative and diverse data sets that are going to be coming both from the preclinical and the clinical uh, settings in order to create finally these algorithms that uh, need to be transparent and that need to be trustworthy in order to really ensure that we are achieving this balance between the undesirable and the desirable uh, biases. So this uh, is uh, something, these areas, these challenges are something that uh, they still need a lot of work and there are uh, a lot of things that really need to be addressed in order to solve it. But fortunately, there are many, many initiatives all over the world that are tackling uh, these uh, challenges. And here I'm bringing you just a few examples that I am very excited about. Uh, this example Samples actually are coming from uh, very uh, diverse uh, angles. They are coming from the whole uh, research and technology and healthcare ecosystem. So, uh, for example, here from the governmental and funding agencies, uh, last year there was this uh, publication of a report on gender innovation that is raising awareness of all the issues around uh, ignoring uh, sex and gender, not only in terms of uh, biomedical and healthcare, but also across many different industries. And also uh, from the, Europe, the European uh, Commission as well, uh, there is a lot of effort and a lot of investment that is around the creation of guidelines for trustworthy AI. And both uh, these type of initiatives are going to soon be translated into uh, um, regulations and policies that that are going to enforce uh, the changes uh, that are really going to achieve this uh, proper uh, data diversity and trustworthy uh, algorithms. Then on the more academic uh, side of things and consortiums, I would like to mention this uh, project, this initiative that is uh, uh, a very uh, collaborative uh, work from 23 countries that is uh, aiming at having by next year uh, sequenced uh, more than 1 million genomes. Uh, and this is uh, really uh, going to create a network of health data together with genome data. And it's really going to provide the outstanding basis for personalized medicine. I also would like to mention here, particularly uh, from Barcelona, a project that is about the creation of a precision medicine hub that is part of the Ciudadela del Conocimiento project. And right now, uh, this is a project that is in the very early stages and the buildings are being constructed for this. But in the coming years, the, I'm sure that this uh, precision medicine hub is going to provide very valuable insights and it's going to be very helpful to move uh, the whole uh, discipline forward. And then uh, here I'm going to give you just uh, very briefly uh, some hints from the more industry side of things. So 
this uh, initiative is of particular interest for me because uh, it's on neurodegenerative disorder, the Davos Alzheimer Collaborative. This is a public-private partnership, and it's aiming at making an atlas of Alzheimer's disease by creating a global cohorts uh, across the world, including uh, people suffering from Alzheimer's disease uh, from very different uh, socio-demographic uh, backgrounds. And the aim is to identify the heterogeneity to better tackle the symptoms and to possibly create the more effective treatments in the short term. Uh, in the last example here, I'm going to uh, give you uh, more like a general um, impression of the general trend in the pharmaceutical sector and also in the technology, uh, more like startup sector, that is that most of these uh, uh, institutions and companies and entities are going uh, to a way of working that is uh, going beyond the pill, moving away from only drug development and going into the creation of solutions that are trying to achieve these five rights. That means uh, to provide the right drug to the right patient at the right time, the right dose and through the right route. And this is for sure very, very at the core of uh, personalized and precision medicine. And I'm sure like these type of initiatives, all of these ones that I'm mentioning here, but many more are going to provide the right path for personalized medicine if they are also including the sex and gender perspective. Uh, so last but not least, I would like to just um, very briefly mention that uh, we are uh, just about to get our book published. This is again work by the Women's Brain Project together with the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and other uh, well-known institutions. Uh, this is a, a book that is specifically about sex and gender bias in artificial intelligence for biomedicine, and we are covering a number of very relevant topics. Uh, within this uh, subject. So I encourage everyone interested in this uh, area to stay tuned because we are going to get it uh, published uh, very soon around August. And with that, uh, thank you so much. And I will be happy to start with the panel discussion. Exactly. Thank you, uh, Silvina, for outlining the relationship between uh, the inter individual uh, differences and uh, technology, not only highlighting the risk of propagating uh, inequalities, but also like the, the great potential and uh, the benefits of uh, doing things right, and, uh, and also the initiatives and the work that is ongoing in this uh, direction uh, worldwide. So yes, uh, uh, we uh, have to quick transition to the panel discussion. So I would just like starting saying that uh, uh, in my opinion something that emerged from uh, your presentation is uh, definitely the interdisciplinarity uh, that is required to, to achieve uh, an, an unbiased precision medicine and, uh, and this is of course uh, very much into the, the nature of this multi-layered understanding of uh, health and disease that we are trying to, to achieve so uh, for, for these reasons like given your different backgrounds and this interdisciplinarity I would like to start by asking to each one of you, when in your professional trajectory did you face for the first time the problem of sex and gender misrepresentation in the health domain? I will start with uh, Carmen. Well, I was uh, engaged for the first time when I was uh, finishing my medicine studies and uh, during all the medicine studies, no one uh, talked me about menstruation. So it was only uh, an hour. So can you hear me properly? So. Ah, not the whole micro post? Yes. Now the, there are technical problems. We are. Ah. <laughs> Cierro esto. Y ahora, ¿me oís? Can you hear me now? Pues, uh, well, I was telling you that I began to work in this field since I realized that during my studies, no one told me about 
menstruation and by the time in Spain we didn't have all these studies and many other ways for you to find uh, different sources of information I went to Madrid at the endocrinology I Ibero-American medicine school and I wanted to study in depth the menstruation cycle. Suddenly I realized that there were no studies and we held the first conference of uh, women and um, quality of life in Barcelona in 1990 and I introduced my uh, thesis about mortality. Valeria, what's your story? Valeria, can you hear in us? My, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. So, uh, in my case, um, I guess it started when uh, I was an MD student, and every time I was told that uh, in my clinical uh, reasoning, diagnostics process, uh, and uh, prescription of drugs, I should take into consideration the, the findings of the randomized control trial. And so I start that are also the, um, the evidence that are used for uh, um, providing guidelines for the treatment. And then I discovered that uh, when I apply that uh, recommendation, uh, sometimes I um, unfortunately incur in no efficacy for drugs in women and or a higher proportion of uh, adverse uh, events. And then uh, I came back to the randomized control trial and I discovered that there was really a low proportion of women enrolled, meaning that uh, my practice was not evidence-based. And that was my first experience as a practicing clinician on how, how biased is the evidence that hmm. we have from randomized control trial. Thank you. Luis. Yes, Luis. Um, okay, so I, I'm not a woman, so I did not face it personally. I'd like to first say that. So I, I bow down to all the women in the panel to, to discuss that. I will have, say that I first encountered this. I, I was working in the early uh, uh, 2000s in Los Alamos at the Los Alamos National Laboratory in um, in a functional genomics project. And like many people mentioned here, I, we realized that a lot of our data sets uh, from clinical trials had many more men than women in what we are analyzing. I mean, I, I wanna do bring a, a, another uh, a, a point for this, that it's, I mean, it's beyond gender, right? So at Los Alamos too, I was very, uh, it was in our face that there was a, a horrible history there of making medical experiments with Native Americans, for instance. So it was so the biases that existed there was they were very visible to me. Uh, there was a historical um, nature to that, and that's the one thing I would point here also that we really have to look at the context. Some of these things do not translate from one country to another. Whether we look at gender, where we look at race, um, in particular, for instance, my experience in the United States is that of a Latino, uh, which you know has its own, own biases. But when I'm in Portugal or in Spain, I'm one of the dominant white males. So the context in which one operates is very important. I think we also have a re be very careful about generalizing the experiences as we go from one place to another and one data set to another. So that's why we like these comparative cross-national um, um, approaches. So uh, yes, I, I, I was saying uh, definitely, definitely, I totally agree. And uh, uh, Silvina, what is your story? Yes, so basically my story uh, to face for the first time this uh, sex and gender misrepresentation was when I was doing my PhD. I did a lot of uh, experimental work with animal models of disease, uh, particularly with uh, models of Down syndrome. And the very vast majority of uh, scientific articles was published with uh, male mice. Uh, so my project actually started 
by having both uh, male and female mice uh, and I wanted to uh, carry on doing everything all my different uh, experiments uh, with the male and female mice I ended up with uh, these uh, 16 experimental groups uh, that wasn't really uh, sustainable uh, and finally uh, at the last stage I kept only my female uh, mice which actually represented a challenge because whenever I had to compare my results with the rest of the results of the literature they were not fully comparable so that kept me thinking quite a lot about this uh, sex uh, representation of preclinical studies uh, and later on so I, I kept on thinking about this and this was something I was very interested in also because of neurological and psychiatric conditions show a huge difference of prevalence and, and symptom manifestation between uh, men and women. And that's why then I joined the Women's Brain Project and I have been working in the subject for you know, several years now. Silvina, I'm also a member of the Women's Brain Project and uh, Silvina and I, of course, collaborate on this, on this topic. We are the uh, first co-authors of the, of the paper she was mentioning. So, um, I would like to, uh, to consider again this uh, relevance, this importance of the context that, uh, that Louise was mentioning before. And uh, I would like to ask uh, Valeria, um, so do you think that uh, uh, gender medicine, no? uh, I mean, it's clear that it's a gateway way to uh, precision medicine but as we were saying before like the context is really important so it's not just the two categories of uh, women and men but we also have to intersect a lot more in order to really uh, have a precision medicine to realize a precision medicine uh, approach so uh, what do you think about this so for sure as we all mentioned i guess we we need to um overcome this uh, binary thinking way and we need to to look at sex and gender intersection more as a spectrum and i totally agree with louise that it's really relevant to take it into consideration how much gender especially is country cultural based and how some biological factors can have a different effect on health depending on the country where you live, on the culture you have. As Louise, I also have been uh, living in other countries, and I totally agree that uh, it's, it's really make the difference where, where you live uh, and the environment. And then uh, if it parts of the epigenetic uh, modulation and biological factors, or if it's all about uh, lifestyle behaviors, uh, really we, we cannot uh, distangle too much these two aspects, but I really think that it's important to, to look at the intersection between them and, and also to see how this intersection between sex and gender um, feels uh, in uh, with and a match with other characteristics uh, such as race socioeconomic status religion mm -hmm. and so on because uh, really health uh, as it's not just the absence of a disease uh, it's uh, uh, the complete well-being uh, in uh, biology social and uh, mental health mm. Okay, and uh, um, along these lines, I, I would like to ask Luis, um, so what are the risks uh, associated to not including uh, uh, the sex and gender perspective in uh, biomedical research and uh, clinical practice? Uh, in particular, thinking on uh, uh, artificial intelligence and their applications, no? So the, the risks of not including this perspective in the, in the design and the development, um, what we are, what, what we, are facing uh, if we are not uh, addressing those issues? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to be comprehensive on this because there's, of course, a lot of risks. But uh, so I, I, I'll, I'll bring out some of what I did in my presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but, you know, by, so by not including a theoretical underpinning of where you're working and also by not including diversity in your teams in which you work, you're probably not even considering uh, questions that you should be asking. So if you are using AI and machine learning, because as I outlined, 
they're automatic um, induction machines. If you, there's a big tendency to just trust the data that you have because the data speaks. That's what we do in data science, right? So it becomes even more important to question systematically what you obtain from this, whether it's with the inclusion of null models. And I find that particularly like when you build null models, which is something we bring a lot from physics, right, to, to, to do this, it works much better when you have people with different perspectives in your team, yeah. that they come and say, well, have you considered this, right? Because as we were just talking, we live in different countries. Uh, we might not even consider what are the issues of Native Americans, say, if you're not in the United States. And therefore, so these questions you ask are very important for this. I, I would draw attention to a, a, a paper from a couple of years ago from Akiko Iwazaki at Yale. Um, she's an immunologist and she said why we need to increase diversity in the immunology research community. And she means diversity not just in gender, but in, in all aspects so that we can question this. Um, I will also finalize with one thing. I mean, listening to you guys speak is very refreshing, but it is actually interesting when you go to say to other uh, conferences on gender um, in which it's, it's almost a no-no, it's almost taboo to talk about um, biological differences between the genders or uh, because it's so, so we, we have to be aware that it is we work in a realm where this is very problematic for many other people to even talk about the, the, those differences. So, but at the same time, that's the positive thing in, because our field, let's face it, has had some bad names that have mentioned some things about biological uh, determinants of behavior and intelligence that people are very afraid to go there. So I think it's very important that we do this very well so that we can honestly speak about the biological differences while accepting the social constructions aspect. So that's why I thought it was very, the work that Sylvina and Valeria were very cool because you are addressing both the, the biological and also the social aspects of this and, and rather than running away from it. So I do think there's a positive perspective here. Uh, so I, rather than talking about risks, as you asked me, I'm talking about the possibilities, which is I think what's cool about what we can do is that we can sort of resolve some of these issues. Yes, yes, but uh, I mean, it's also like uh, extremely important the, the, the point that you are raising about the, the acceptance no, and the way uh, this, uh, this research no, is also communicated, especially to, to the layman and to the public audience, no? and, and how if it's really understood. And this is always like a, a stigma that if you think uh, thoroughly, it's, uh, it, it, I mean, it's a risk also inherent in, in precision medicine, if you want, like placing people in boxes, no? and, uh, and this is really not, not, not well uh, seen. So most of the time you don't see the benefit of it, but you only see that this might uh, create problems and, uh, you know, conflict and uh, discrimination. So, of course, I, I don't know if some of you would like to uh, add something to this point of the acceptance of uh, what we are doing here in the, in the public. No one? No thoughts? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Yes, we, we, we really uh, need to be careful no, on, the, on the way we communicate things and, uh, and then to do things right. So, uh, Carmen, I, I would like to, uh, to ask you, um, so you, you show also in your presentation that uh, a lot of, uh, um, of uh, studies, new studies are coming out about sex differences. And uh, so I would like to, to know uh, how mature is the status of this discipline, let's call it gender medicine, uh, beyond reproductive medicine or uh, what are the, the medical branches and spe specialties that are the most promising, let's say, the, the ones for which there is more evidence. Yeah. Uh, bueno, no well, it's not quite a mature situation, if I'm uh, frank with you, because in everything that has to do with uh, reproductive health, not only reproductive health, I'm talking about the natural, uh, specific women lives all along their lives, menstruation, uh, being pregnant, after being pregnant and all the different uh, troubles that a woman can suffer 
has been reducted. It has been one of the areas in medicine that has experienced a great leap in 2000, 2002 and 3, and suddenly disappeared in a global media. In all the research works and articles, because the majority of medical intervention has not to do with better analyzing menstruation and all the different contexts related, stress related, the environment, as well as uh, the polychlorarium and all the chemicals that has a role and impact on menstruation. Suddenly, we forget menstruation with all the uh, drugs, the hormone drugs, and all the contraceptive and medicines, and we don't study. After pregnancy, we have uh, several uh, troubles with the thyroid, 25% uh, of women suffer. We call it post-pregnancy depression, and we do not treat in a proper manner due to the environmental effects. We have a hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism after pregnancy. And suddenly, uh, we treat women that uh, something different. We want them to have menstruation without knowing that it is not needed after a pregnancy. Because we scientifically know that we can keep bone health without needing to introduce hormones that will produce breast cancer and uh, other coronary issues. So we are not in a very mature situation. Therefore, that everything that has to do with AI can help us to better manage. And I do agree with you, Luis. I do agree with you because we cannot deny that we can witness biological differences favoring uh, those people that want to get hormones because they have a different gender identity. But they must uh, think that liver will change because they will take a certain drug. Uh, XY or XX human being liver will metabolize the hormones the way the hormones have to metabolize. and. This can have an impact, just when we talk about uh, the transition between uh, women that wants to be men, they suffer a problem because the testosterone going to a women liver will be an estrogen. So there are some elements that science will help us to better understand. But this is not a stop for people to change gender. But from a biological perspective, we can see that we have 43 uh, proteins in our body that rely on different cells that are different between men and women. The methencephalic barrier is also different between men and women. So the knowledge will help us to better treat or not to treat, because sometimes it's better not to treat. Um, going back to, to artificial intelligence, so I would like to ask Silvina, um, do you think that the, the current use of artificial intelligence in health is uh, creating new risks of magnifying inequalities and discrimination? I would actually like really, I'm interested in the, in the current state, so artificial intelligence, how it is developed right now, uh, is creating those problems, those issues, and what, uh, what can be done? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that uh, in a way, uh, this uh, double-edged sword type of framework is uh, showing both the, the the good side of artificial intelligence, and we all agree that it is very promising and powerful. But uh, the dark side of it is that actually there are lots of ways in which artificial intelligence is creating uh, more inequalities. And actually, we are seeing uh, several examples of this, not only in the healthcare. Uh, domain, but also in the uh, criminal uh, justice, for example, whenever algorithms are used to assess and, and predict uh, additional uh, criminal um, harassment by people and sometimes these are actually harmful and these are providing disadvantages for minorities and i think that luis mentioned some of this in his presentation uh, 
and also they are uh, being shown a similar type of uh, algorithm discrimination uh, in other sectors like uh, in for example in terms of uh, loans whenever an algorithm uh, is uh, used in order to decide whether a candidate is uh, good for uh, a bank to release a loan and sometimes these are not uh, good predictions and are dis uh, disadvantages for certain minorities and they are unfair so also you know a lot of these type of uh, examples in which technology is used in a way that is raising inequalities are very highlighted in the media so that uh, leads to a lot of people to be concerned and to be afraid of how technology can be used for things that are going to be potentially harmful for them and yeah i definitely agree that uh, technology in the end of the day uh, it's a mirror to our society and is uh, using uh, the data sets that are mirroring uh, the way that we are collecting the data sets. And sometimes uh, we are collecting data sets in a wrong way, not because we are evil, but uh, because we are not paying attention to all these uh, potential confounding factors. It's like Luis was mentioning, the black swan. It's like, I'm sure like uh, we are half of the population women, but we were still not considered, we are black swans and nobody really paid attention to it so similar things can happen in all over the place and and these are creating uh, potential hazards in te in technology thank you thank you and uh, uh, regarding regarding this i would like to ask uh, uh, carmen and also uh, valeria uh, about the cognitive biases so that can be also present in the in the doctor and how this can affect the medical practice and as Silvina was mentioning even the data collection so uh, carmen first si. uh yes it is very very tricky it is very tricky to change stereotypes and models because they belong to us and it's something very intimate when we assess our own behavior and our personal perspective. I can see much more possibilities in younger generations, uh, medical professionals, researchers. They are just these young generations, they are much more aware about uh, gender stereotypes they suffer themselves this kind of discriminations and they have in mind then everything that everything can change however we must boost these new technologies the canadian standard as well as the national investigation health uh, in the u.s that healy said in 1993 he said that all research papers had to include women men and different uh, ethnic minorities. This was quite a big progress. So with the public funds, we couldn't accept to partially investigate. And through these public policies, let's work in order to make things invisible visible. And suddenly, we must see the bias of diagnosis. Suddenly, we do not properly translate the laboratory results and these data will be introduced as very important data but if they are biased if we still consider that it's a common in women and it's normal them not to have enough iron we still have this gender bias because iron should be at the same level for men and women why women should have less iron it's much more frequent but it's the frequent things are not normal and to change this mindset it's very tough because all medicine schools they teach that what is frequent it's normal gender violence it's frequent but it's not normal right why do we have to tolerate that everything that is frequent to be normal why do we have to accept that uh, women suffering anemia it's normal because it's frequent or alzheimer women they suffer much more alzheimer than men and we don't know why let's try to look for near risk factors very difficult to change also about this the the, the presence of uh, the, the effect of cognitive bias in uh, in medical practice and valeria can you hear us 
Could you please repeat your question? Yes, <laughs> I would like to. Because, uh, I would I like to to ask you to comment on uh, uh, the, the the presence of cognitive biases, like for instance uh, gender stereotypes uh, yeah. that can affect the medical practice and even the data collection. Okay, so the the, the for sure, as already um, Carmen mentioned, the the problem is that. Uh, when we, we are medical students, uh, the young generation are trained by big picture, big clinical scenario. What I'm trying to do now uh, as a professor, every time I, I give a, a clinical picture, I ask to the student, uh, my colleagues, uh, would you be different to your uh, um, clinical reasoning mm. if uh, the person you have in front of you is a man or a woman or a gender diverse people? And then uh, they stop and they start to reflect that uh, there are some difference and uh, if they do not take into consideration these differences, they can also uh, uh, achieve uh, the wrong diagnosis uh, or uh, maybe give more relevance uh, to an aspect uh, that uh, is uh, more frequent, as Carmen said, uh, in males uh, or in females, because the, I mean, the, the, the disparity is, is for both uh, women and males. I really don't want that uh, uh, the message here is that we want to take care of individuals uh, independently by their sex, their gender, uh, whatever. So we want to really um, change the mindset of the younger generation. Um, but uh, as we mentioned before, we need uh, really um, also an effort from uh, um, university and the education system to make more uh, uh, transdisciplinary the integration of uh, gender medicine across all the specialties because it's not a new specialty yeah. it's a, an approach that should be uh, used independently by your uh, uh, your specialty the disease or whatever because it, it it fits and it applies to everything Yes, yes, definitely. So, uh, since we are running out of time, I would like to ask the organization if there are some uh, uh, questions from the, from the audience. So, so, yes, we do have some questions from the audience. La, la primera sería para la... The first one is for Dr. Ivanic. They ask you whether you could talk about the lack of uh, clinical trials uh, for pregnant women, the lack of clinical trials for pregnant women. Yeah, this was a problem which aroused um, when we had the thalidomide, which generated congenital malformations so severe that it, they stopped the clinical trials on pregnant women. And it is a problem of an, of an ethical nature, but at the same time, and we have seen this with the pandemic, that it was essential also to know whether a vaccine could produce an effect or another. So it is a problem that brings together the ethics with the need to research. And in this sense, what we need is to have more rigor, uh, more rigorous in the design of the clinical trial. But yes, it is a loophole. It is a breach. Uh, it is a gap that we need to bridge. But we have some more gaps to bridge. It's not, uh, we're failing to study, for example, the evolution of the proteins in blood during the menstrual cycle or whether the cholesterol should be measured at one point or the other. But obviously, pregnant women is uh, a gap. A bit related to what you mentioned before, now we're talking a lot about the AstraZeneca and Janssen vaccines and the problem they are generating in women, but this is not commented too much. Uh, and then we have also the subject of the adverse effects it's having, which are higher in the case uh, of contraceptives uh, which are commonly prescribed to women. Yes, this is a paradox because when, for example, in the GAPS group, in, in, in some of the medicines you're going to see, uh, we denounce the secondary effect of the contraceptives, which is 
unknown. And right now, all the media are talking about the fact that the contraceptives can generate thrombosis when it is not the cause for the problem of the vaccine. I can intervene saying that what's going on with the thrombosis of the vaccine is a is an autoimmune problem which doesn't have anything to do or relatively it doesn't it's not directly related to taking contraceptives or not it, um, women are more prone to having that than men and this is something we can see in the literature because of different uh, um, drugs and there are 38 drugs that can generate this uh, thrombosis similar to heparin because women, as I explained at the beginning, are more predisposed to autoimmune illnesses. Firstly, because they have more defenses against infections, as it's being proved with the pandemic. We have always said that women have a different, have, have a different immunity, which is prolonged over time, and, uh, and, and, and against infections. I think that's one of the reasons why the life expectancy is higher. But there is a double-edged sword in these defenses because then autoimmunity is more frequent among women. So we need to pay close attention to the evolution of any drug you introduce in the women's body. The audience, ha hello. Hello. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, congratulations for the panel. It was very, very interesting. And I have a, a question that I think is like a more um, an open question uh, to all the panelists, because well, we are we talking about uh, personalized medicine, about uh, sex and gender bias in medicine. So we are we are mixing uh, sex with gender, and it's not the same. So sex is something biological, and gender is something social and cultural. So my question is. First, uh, why we are talking about the same, the both topics in the same uh, in the same environment, and second, uh, how uh, artificial intelligence can help to solve the problems in in gender bias, because in sex it's more or less clear how the artificial intelligence can help, but in gender bias, how? That is my question. Thank you. So if someone from uh, uh, the panel would like to, to, to ask to this question why we are talking about sex and gender in the same place and, uh, and uh, why maybe for sex this can be easier, let's say, to address, especially for uh, artificial intelligence, while for gender there are a lot of, uh, let's say, gray areas and, uh, and uh, not really well understood uh, things. So uh, I don't know if someone would like to say something about this. <laughs> so uh, I guess uh, that the so because of uh, the the nature of gender, which is as I said, uh, um, a multi-dimensional, uh, complex uh, social construct, the the really the the biggest hurdle that uh, we we all face. Uh, is to, to find a way to capture probably, properly such complexity. Um, of course, uh, when we try to, we are scientists, so we need, we need a measure of something, right? And uh, as uh, uh, Louis mentioned before, uh, sometimes uh, we, we want to simplify uh, the complexity, but this is the only way that uh, we have to, to do science right now. So the best that we can do is start to think that uh, there are some uh, um, gender-based determinants of health that we are not used to incorporate, include, start to collect them. Because as I said before, uh, it's not uh, really common that uh, even in our uh, um, clinical practice, we ask to our patient, uh, uh, which is your work, uh, uh, give me information about your family, do you have social support, uh, or uh, how, how do you feel, how do you perceive yourself, uh, and which are the struggles that you are facing because of your uh, identity. And then we, if we collect this information, I think that once we use also this, uh, this, uh, this factor in relation with biology, which is it seems to be more, uh, more, uh, more simple to, to consider, to measure. We really can uh, uh, try at least to, to, to have um, a sense of more the complexity of the people that we have. Of course, it's more complex because there is not a standardized method. So you cannot uh, 
test for gender, right? <laughs> there is not a lab test for that. But uh, the fact that this is complex uh, should not uh, avoid us to, to explore this landscape because th this is all about uh, do better science uh, and do something that it's uh, um, generalizable for all people uh, all across the world. And it's, I think it's a duty for uh, a clinical scientist to go through these difficulties in measuring gender or having more uh, fair uh, and equitable results. Thank you. Carmen, we have to, yes. Uh, I fully, fully agree with Valeria. And at the same time, there are studies which have been conducted that have shed light precisely when introducing the gender, for example, in, um, in Karolinska, in, in Sweden, Marianne Frankenhauser and Lundberg, um, in endocrine and psychology working hand in hand, have assessed the physical and mental stress um, entailed in different jobs, because it's not just um, work, uh, life conditions, but working conditions. And, um, uh, and, and also, uh, we need to place the environment, what they eat, where they live, etc. So those um, working conditions, how they have an effect on the cardiovascular risk for men and women, because they showed some time ago that working, well, that at work, men is placed because of identity issues, because of competitiveness, are placed under stress with higher cortisol and adrenaline levels. And the women with the same working conditions, um, executives in Sweden, men and women working in the same job position in, in the women, the adrenaline and noradrenaline and cortisol increased in the uh, evening and at, uh, and at night preparing the next day's conference, but uh, doing the double working day and the double working day which is a social and gender based aspect introduced a, a cardiovascular problem because on the next morning when you are sleeping with high adrenaline levels you're not going to sleep as well etc so it entails some uh, pain muscle pain anxiety and alterations irritable uh, colon syndrome related to the double working day work at home etc so they also opened my eyes, they shed light because uh, they could study conditioning factors uh, which were gender-based that should be taken into consideration. And right now, some cardiologists, when conducting the Halter test, whereby they introduce an apparatus in order to um, monitor the uh, frequency and um, the heart rate and, uh, and the um, blood pressure, through 24 hours, they saw that they needed to relate that to the conditions of the women. What were you doing, you woman, at that time when, when there was a peak in the heart rate or blood pressure? What were you doing? And if you draw a parallel line, and in fact, they ask you, they ask the patient that in addition to have the halter apparatus to uh, keep a log of what they were doing all throughout those 24 hours. And this is a biomarker an objective biomarker that entails a long-term cardiovascular risk. Why is there more hypertension in women? Which are the reasons for that? We need to think. I'm not saying that it's not just a biological, but we need to think about that. And as Valeria rightly mentioned, uh, the science, uh, uh, well, it's our duty in science use uh, more data no? uh, in order to design better technologies so really this integration is definitely needed so if there are no other questions uh, from the audience maybe one there's one last question one last yeah. question okay yeah it reads uh, los protocolos de actuación the pro protocols for clinical action are standardized. Is it easy to include the new knowledge that take into consideration sex differences that affect the diagnosis and the treatment of a certain pathology? Sorry, but I didn't hear you properly. Could you repeat the question? The clinical action protocols are standardized processes. Is it easy to include in those protocols the new knowledge that confirms sex-based differences that affect diagnosis and treatment of a certain pathology? 
let me begin and then uh, let's open it to the rest. Um, let me tell you that it's not easy to include it, but it is necessary to include those factors. And when I'm asked that question in Spain, I tell them, look, in Spain we have an equality law in the year 2007 that amended the health care um, regulation because we did it in our group and it is amended. And the according to the law, we need to take into consideration the sex differences in all protocols and to take into consideration the social, psychological, gender conditions that can be a conditioning factor in the health. So by law, it is established in Spain, not in reality. It's not implemented. But when someone asks me, uh, look, um, if someone tells you that this should not be included in the protocol, your service manager is not abiding by the law. According to the law, this is what should be done. Um, but obviously it's going to be difficult to change the protocols, but there are changes. The other panelists will, would like to add something on uh, those difficulties now when the protocols are so strict and uh, there are some regulations that impede the inclusion, the easy inclusion of uh, these kind of considerations. Um, that, that's obviously, you know, something something very difficult to. So um, yeah, I, I don't know if maybe Luis, uh, if you can, in in terms like more on the. On the industry, you now when, when you when you develop and deploy a, a, a system, you no, know, that has, for instance, an application in uh, in health, these kind of requirements uh, are not really there. I mean, it's really up to the to the researcher if uh, to to consider, you know, the impact, especially under the lens of uh, uh, sex and gender. Well, not so much. I mean, uh, anymore. I think, uh, uh, for instance, to, to, to develop an application in any health domain, we are developing one for epilepsy patients, in particular. For instance, you do really have to go through the IRB approval, so the ethics approval about everything you do. Our research is funded by NIH, which now plays a lot. I mean, any sort of human subject studies has to have. Um, you know, all sorts of, of, of regulations about uh, considering sex uh, as a variable, uh, not so much gender in the way we're talking about it, in the socially constructed way, which, which also has biomedical implications. Um, but I mean, it is, it, it is frustrating in some ways about uh, the lack of, 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 of uh, the same criteria, right? So even when you try to publicate, publish your results, different journals have very different criteria. And sometimes we get papers rejected because we cannot retrospectively go change our ethics permission for what, what you do. Um, and especially in my case, I use social media data too to try to understand the social implications of things that it is, it becomes very erratic. So I, I think it's growing pains. I think we will get to this. Uh, uh, eventually, we will settle to do this better. But right now, it is it is a little dangerous. I advise everybody to think very, very carefully when you do your ethics permission, you, you, your IRB, to try to think of all the problems that people can throw at you uh, later on, as you all know. I, I mean, so, but it is a very difficult thing to, 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 to do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm, well, I, I think that uh, I, I can close the session and uh, by thanking, uh, thanking all of you so much uh, for, for your contribution to this, uh, to this event. I, I really enjoyed this, uh, this experience and I, I'm confident that all the things that we, that we have discussed today will, uh, will serve as a stepping stone no, to overcome this issue of uh, misrepresentation and uh, discrimination of uh, uh, sex and gender categories in uh, biomedicine. And above all, uh, help building a more equitable society. So thank you again. And uh, to the audience, see you to the next uh, seminar of this uh, cycle. Thank you so much.